Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jamie Holmes. The April inflation report is out, and while it shows the run-up in prices could be beginning to peak, it still remains high, and that is straining Americans' checkbooks. With prices up 0.3% just in the past month, this is the first decline in the consumer price index in eight months. It was a weaker improvement than economists were predicting. Lauren Blanchard is in D.C. with more. April showed an 8.3% consumer price index year over year, a bit higher than predictions. But for the first time in eight months, the number is slightly down from March's 8.5%. For me, you know, there are really no signs that inflation is slowing down. There's no sign that the Fed's policies are having any effect at all right now. Over the last year, food up 9.4%. Meat and eggs soaring in price. Also sky high, airfare jumping 18.3% from March to April. All energy prices up more than 30%. Fuel oil up a staggering 80%. I've been affected by inflation by the cost of gasoline, by the cost of groceries, uh, by the cost of, uh, of electricity going up. Over the last 12 months, wages have increased 5.5%. But compared to the more than 8% inflation rate, it means Americans are still taking home less money. Let's face it, this, uh, this is a result of policies. It's a result that inflation, Joe Biden can try to deflect blame all he wants. The president is pointing the finger at the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and Republicans for the problems. And the White House says that they're working to turn it around. Our economy is gone from being on the mend to on the move. Gas prices hit another record again Wednesday. According to AAA, now $4.40 a gallon nationally. In Washington, Lauren Blanchard, Fox News. With summer fast approaching, could the current economy force you to change your plans in the sun? The rising cost of travel spurred on by inflation is putting pressure on the American family's summer vacation. Hotel costs are up 30 percent from last year, with airfare up 24 percent, rental cars up nearly 14 percent. This coupled with the rising price of gas could force many families to rethink their plans. The Chemung County Sheriff's Office is hosting boater safety classes starting this month. The youngest a person can attend that class is 10 years old. The Sheriff's Office says in the near future, anyone operating a boat or other watercraft must obtain a boating license and complete the safety class. The classes are free. They last eight hours with a 30-minute lunch break. You must be pre-registered to attend. For more information, call the number on your screen. A man accused of killing a woman and stuffing her body in a duffel bag has been arraigned in New York City. The suspect, 44-year-old David Benola, was the victim's lover. He was also the handyman for the woman, 51-year-old Ursula Gall. Gall was murdered in her home in Queens on April 16th. Prosecutors say Benola stabbed Gall more than 50 times and stuffed her body in a duffel bag after the two argued and Gall asked Benola to leave. Benola has been charged with 13 counts, including murder and concealing a human corpse. He pleaded not guilty. If convicted, he could be sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Investigators say a man is in critical condition in Philadelphia after he attacked officers with a screwdriver inside a police station. It happened inside this police station in the northwest part of the city. According to police, an officer who was behind a glass window in an operations room was trying to talk to a man who was outside the room. The officer couldn't hear the man and exited. That's when they say the man attacked the officer. At some point during the struggle, another officer shot at the attacker. The police department's officer-involved shooting investigations unit is now looking into it. Now to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is stepping up the economic war against Russia as fighting on the front lines remains at a stalemate. Trey Yingst has the latest. The Russian offensive is intensifying in southern Ukraine on day 77 of the invasion. Russian missiles still hitting Odessa, Ukraine's biggest port city, hoping to disrupt the flow of weapons to the front lines. Transportation infrastructure is being increasingly targeted, but the Pentagon says the weapons are still getting where they need to go. We're tracking no impact to the flow of, of, uh, and shipment of material into Ukraine, either as a result of the strikes on Odessa or the strikes anywhere else. Uh, that stuff continues to flow every day. 
The Russians still haven't made any major breakthroughs, but they appear to be committing more resources to southern Ukraine, hoping to connect forces in the Crimean Peninsula with the eastern line of attack. The Ukrainians say the tactic won't work, and they're slowly pushing the Russians back from major cities like Kharkiv. I'm grateful to all our defenders who are holding the line and showing truly superhuman strength to drive out the army of invaders. The economic battle also escalating. Ukraine blocked Russia from using a hub that supplies about a third of Europe's natural gas. The pipeline operator says it will switch to another hub, but flows are already down about 25 percent. Most Ukrainians say they're not concerned about economic retaliation. We have everything that we need, but prices are getting a little bit higher. That's why sometimes it's uh, for ordinary people, it's very difficult. Ukraine's economy is expected to contract about 30 percent this year because of the war. In Kyiv, Trey Inkst, Fox News. The House has passed some crucial Ukrainian aid. A $40 billion aid package was passed with wide bipartisan support, approving $7 billion more than requested. This comes as Russia continues to push across southeastern Ukraine, and Ukrainian forces have desperate need for more weaponry. The aid package will help beef up Ukrainian weapons systems, replenish supplies, help the economy, and even help reduce the global food shortage. Newly released body cam footage from the Alabama inmate crash reveals more details how the 11-day manhunt came to an end. Valerie Lyons has more on the story. Newly released body cam footage showing the chaotic moments after Vicki and Casey White's 11-day run from the law came to a screeching halt. Following a 15-minute pursuit, we now know it was Casey White who was behind the wheel and crashed the pair's Cadillac after law enforcement collided with the car. Basically rammed the vehicle and pushed it into a ditch. And we later found out, had they not done that, the fugitive was going to engage in a shootout with law enforcement. In one video captured by an Evansville police officer running to the scene, you can hear the six foot nine fugitive inmate asking if the former corrections officer is all right. His wife, as he refers to her, though authorities confirm the two were not married. She still got it in her hand. I don't know. Got the gun in her hand? All right, watch it. 44 News obtained this 911 call made by 56-year-old Vicki White during the pursuit. Soon after, the line goes silent. We know around that time, White shot herself in the head. She died hours later at the hospital. This new footage gives a detailed look at the pursuit and moments immediately after. But it's what law enforcement later uncovered from the car that widens the scope and provides some answers in a case filled with countless questions. And we have photos of the weapons that were located in the vehicle. An AR-15, four handguns and three magazines, Vicki White's service belt and several wigs, plus $29,000 in cash, an amount seemingly left over from the 95,000 Vicki White got from selling her house days before the escape. There are several tragedies, you know, to this story, the way this escape ended, but also to it's things that somebody entrusted with what she was given uh, as a correctional officer planned, organized and facilitated uh, this escape. We have a look at our forecast next, plus a breast cancer survivor is using the power of fashion to help others struggling with the deadly disease. Stay with us. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Well, we have been on a big warming trend since last Friday, and even yesterday we topped off at about 78 degrees as we stay under this very pleasant spring-like pattern that is going to continue as even today we were able to see those temperatures climb within the 80s as abundant sunshine continued to dominate. Another view from that National Weather Service in Binghamton just shows the bright blue skies that we kept for much of the daytime forecast and keep into place as well as another round of the 80s will be on the way for us. Now through the overnight under those clear and calm skies, lows will 
fall back into the 40s. Not too frigid overall, looking at about just on par for average for this time of the year. Now, do know that there is a statewide burn ban in place until May 14th, as we are dealing with this time period with some really dry conditions, dry soils as we continue to see the growing season start up, as well as some winds at times could be a bit stronger that could spread fires at times. So noting that that uh, burn bans in place, that means that even just the backyard fires limit those because a spark can fly very quickly and spark up those fires. We already seen that the fire season has started for portions of the southwest of the continental United States. But overall, our pattern is going to stay sun sunny and warm as that sunshine is going to be able to bring temperatures back into the 80s for your Thursday, potentially Friday. Now again, as mentioned, not record breaking 90s are our records, but what we will see is that the weekend is going to bring some changes when it comes to some weekend uh, wet weather as well as maybe some isolated thunder even possible as early as your Friday forecast. Now looking at Thursday overall, we have that abundant sunshine in store for us quickly turning those 50s into the 80s by the afternoon, even looking at lower to mid 80s for our area. We'll see that the winds expected to stay fairly light up to about 7 to 10 miles per hour. Average for this time of the year though is 70 degrees, so hitting 84. We're looking at 10 to 15 degrees above average, so pleasant weather to get out to enjoy with. But note that with that mostly sunny sky, sunscreen needed. We have that higher sun angle and burn times are a lot quicker with a higher UV index. So do keep this in mind. Overall, everybody has a chance to see anywhere from those lower 80s into the Finger Lakes to those mid 80s across the area. Binghamton even looking at 83 as well as Myring and Elmira and Corning around 84 to 83 degrees. Friday's temperatures do dial back just a bit upper 70s, lower 80s, and that's due to the chance to work in a touch more cloud cover, a little bit more moisture and maybe an isolated shower or thunderstorm if we're able to get some convection in the area, but what we'll watch is that the bigger uptick in that moisture potential will come in that weekend forecast as you'll see those dew points jump into the 60s. That would typically mean that we're talking about humidity and there might be a little bit at play, but overall most of that is going to be the chance to feel some storms as we will see just an isolated threat on Friday and then more likely chance for some thunderstorms to rumble through the region Saturday and Sunday. Right now not looking like widespread severe storms, but there is definitely going to be the warmth there to maybe fuel a few stronger isolated storms. So we'll watch that potential for both Saturday and Sunday. So unfortunately going to have to bring it inside, but as we head into next week, we are looking at temperatures to cool. So if you're not a fan of the heat, we will be back towards average Monday and then even cool below average through that Wednesday forecast. Cancer touches the lives of so many Americans. Now one breast cancer survivor is using her experience and fashion skills to help make the lives of women battling the disease better. Marianne Rafferty has a special look. We can show the world what cancer really looks like. Dana Donafrey is a breast cancer survivor. I had a bilateral mastectomy with implant reconstruction on both sides. But after the fashion designer underwent her surgeries back in 2010, she wasn't thrilled with a selection of specialty bras available to her and other breast cancer patients. The market was incredibly limiting. Um, I would explain it as being matronly, utilitarian, uh, very basic. Fed up with the one size fits all approach, Donna Free launched her own company, Ana Ono, in 2014, creating flattering and functional bras compatible for women in various stages of breast cancer treatment and recovery. And when it comes to Donna Free's designs, it's all in the details. You need something that's easy to get in and out of. So this is why we have the front hook closure. No elastic up against the skin. It also has a high neckline feature, so it can mimic and hide any of, or it can actually mask and hide any of the scars. According to the CDC, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women, with more than 250,000 diagnosed every year in the U.S. And whether it's in fashion shows or catalogs, Donna Free's company is all about representing them. All of our models online have undergone a breast surgery or been diagnosed with a breast cancer diagnosis, some preventative, some stage four. Ana Ono is available at several online retailers, including Soma and Nordstrom. It's also coming soon to Target.com. As for Donna Free, she's eyeing a collection of swimwear next. Drug overdoses in the U.S. hit record highs last year. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimating that more than 1,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in 2021, a 15% increase from the previous year. The numbers roughly translate to one overdose death every five minutes. Fentanyl and other synthetic opioids were the top overdose causes, followed by cocaine, meth, and other stimulants. Exact numbers are hard to determine since overdose deaths are usually caused by more than one drug. Experts said the pandemic exasperated drug use since the health care system was overwhelmed and lockdowns made seeking treatment harder. 
A touching story out of Lodi, California, where a woman reunites with the firefighters who saved her life. Eaton Wallace has the story. For Elaine Tullis, just walking by this Lodi apartment building she used to call home brings back dark memories of the night she almost lost her life. I could have died right up there. Could have died, she says, because during that evening of February 1st, her apartment on Stockton and Locust Streets near downtown Lodi caught fire with her still inside. You can see what's left of the apartment. Parts of it are charred and boarded up. Tullis says the flames that night blocked all of her escape routes. I said, there's no way out. There's no way out. At that point, she got on her knees and prayed. I knew that I was going to die in the fire. I knew I was. That's the last thing she remembers from that night. Next thing she knows... I just remember waking up in the hospital. There's only room enough for one person in there, so... There, she found out she and the four others inside the apartment were all rescued thanks to these firefighters from the Lodi Fire Department who rushed toward the burning building. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Today, the firefighters got a chance to meet Tullus in an emotional in-person reunion. Some reflected on that February night they rescued her and performed emergency care that saved her life, a life that nearly ended were it not for firefighters like engineer Chris Graves. She was minutes away from passing. Minutes. She, she needed assistance with breathing. Uh, she wasn't breathing very well on her own. Her heart rate was severely depressed. I mean, it was, it was minutes. Graves and his fellow first responders were recognized for their heroism today, but when referred to as heroes, they humbly rejected that description. The reason why we do the job that we do is to help, right? I, I mean, I firmly believe that I was put on this earth to help, and, and we were able to implement all of the things that we've learned and practiced and trained on for the years that we've been here, and it all just came together. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was quite a feat. It's always a, a great thing to meet those people that we get to help. From, from unconscious to to shaking hands and giving hugs is it's a unique experience. It's nice. Glad you're still here. Me too. While Tullis says she has more emotional healing to do, today she's just grateful to be here. I don't know how that big guy got in and out that window. <laughs> it's a pretty small window. But I'm very grateful that he did. I always will be, and he'll always be my hero. They will always be my hero. Heroes for which she'll always be thankful for saving her life. Firefighters across California are gearing up for wildfire season. Jeannie Wynn joins us from Sacramento, where firefighters took part in special training exercises this week. By ground and air, crews with the Sacramento Metro Fire Department put themselves to work today to train for the upcoming fire season. We're practicing on a multi-agency drill in preparation for wildland season in this uh, wooey or, or urban interface environment. That environment is a neighborhood in Orangevale that's surrounded by homes, dry brush, and trees that could easily fuel a wildland fire. We do this uh, quite often actually throughout the year, but in preparation for this upcoming wildland season, we're really ramping up our, our training in this area. You're gonna line inside right now. Training included a drill with multiple fire engines and uh, you're gonna see some progressive hose lays, you're gonna see coordination, interagency coordination with us neighboring fire departments, state parks, as well as helicopter. All of this would not be possible without the help from Sacramento County Regional Parks. While fire crews fight the flames, Regional Parks ensures that people are out of harm's way. To the best of our ability and stuff, protect property, but the number one concern is to protect lives. Last year, the county says there were about 170 fires in the regional parks system. Sergeant Elmer Marzan says a majority of those fires can be prevented. Uh, no open fires, no, uh, no campfires. Campfires uh, are, are very problematic because, you know, wind kicks up, campers get stirred up, and then it causes a fire downrange. Ultimately, the goal of today's exercise we're bringing that black is, line is to be prepared for any challenges during the fire season. We want to leave you with a smile. A new line of Barbies is centered around diversity and inclusion. It includes the first Barbie with behind-the-ear hearing aids. It also includes a doll with a prosthetic leg and a Ken doll with vitiligo, as well as a range of dolls with a variety of body types. The new line of dolls will be in stores next month. That does it for us. I'm Jamie Holmes. Thanks so much for watching.